I mentioned the conversion of Queen Helen, and that's in, not in the war, so you don't have it, but it is in the, uh, it is in the Antiquities, the last book, and interestingly, the last book basically ends with the death of James, somewhere in the 30s or 20s, 30s or 40s. At the same time, Helen of Adiabene, which is, by the way, northern Iraq today, Kurdistan, and her son Isaac became converts to Judaism under the following circumstances. Monopassus, the king of Adiabene, seized with a passion for his sister Helena. So this is either his half-sister or his sister. It seems, remember, in the Bible stories, Abraham says um, Sarah is his sister. Apparently there was some uh, a tradition. Abraham comes from this area in the Bible. And one occasion he was sleeping beside her. He heard a voice bidding him remove his hand from her womb so it was not to cramp the babe. Blah, blah. Some miraculous birth of her son Isatis, I think a name, a variant of Isaac. He also had another son by the same wife, Helena, called Monobasis, like himself, and other children by other wives. So was had huge harems. And this was a favorite wife and her two children. While Izati was residing in Sharak's Fasini, which is today's Basra in southern Iraq, a certain Jewish merchant named Ananias visited the king's wives, taught them to worship God after the manner of the Jewish tradition, and it was through their agency that he brought the notice to the notice of Izat, whom he similarly won over with cooperation of the women. When Izat was summoned by his father back up to Adiabini, and Ananias accompanied him, who greets Paul according to the book of Acts in Damascus? Ananias. It has also happened, moreover, that Helena had likewise been instructed by another Jew who had been brought over to their laws. When Isaias came to Adiabini to take over the kingdom and saw his brothers and his other kingdom in chains, he was distressed. They used to kill all the other brothers so that only one would uh, rule. He sent some of them uh, with their children to Claudius Caesar in Rome as hostages. So Claudius is in the 40s, so it begins to date this. Anyway, when he learned his mother was very much pleased with the Jewish religion, he was zealous to convert to himself, and since he considered that he would be not be genuinely a Jew unless he was circumcised, he was ready to act accordingly. When his mother learned of their intention, however, she tried to stop him. Um, they have arguments over it. Said that she says this would produce disaffection among his uh, citizens. Besides this advice, she tried every means to hold him back. He, in turn, reported her arguments to Ananias. Uh, so Ananias and a second person get in among the women, and uh, their doctrine is the king, he said, can worship God even without circumcision, if indeed he had been fully devoted and adherent of Judaism. That counted more than circumcision. So here we're basically having the argument of Paul is outlining in Galatians against the people who want to circumcise and the people who don't want to circumcise. And Paul is on the non-circumcised side. Ananias here is on the non-circumcised side. And uh, to my view, the unnamed person with Ananias is Paul. Then another zealous Jew from Galilee, a Galilean, comes. He's called Eliezer. And he has a, a reputation for strict adherence to the ancestral laws. And he finds them reading the law of Moses. Well, it's quite clear that um, the, uh, the Talmud has the same story, and it makes it clear that the passage Zappes is reading is Genesis 17.11, where Abraham is commanded, you should be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and then it goes on to say you shall circumcise all the people in your household too. And then he says to them, look, king, in your ignorance, you're guilty of the greatest offense against the law and therefore against God. For you ought not merely to read the law, but also even more to do what it's commanded doing. How long will you continue to be uncircumcised? If you have not yet read the law concerning this matter, read it now so that you may know what an impiety it is to commit. Upon hearing these words, the king postponed the deed no longer, withdrawing immediately to the next room. He summoned his physician and had the prescribed right before then he sent for both his mother and his teacher, Ananias, and notified them that he had performed this rite. Anyway, Helena goes on more about her. She wants to make a trip to Jerusalem. For that time, the city was hard-pressed with famine. Now, this famine is mentioned in the book of Acts. And Paul and Barnabas 
are elected by the community in Antioch to go up and bring famine relief. Oh, here's the parallel here. And many were perishing from want of money to purchase what was needed. Queen Helen sent some of her attendants to Alexandria to buy grain with large sums of money and others to Cyprus to bring back a cargo of dried figs. So she sends her treasury representatives, because she's quite rich, to Cyprus and to Alexandria in Egypt. This is the mid-40s. Her attendant speedily returned with these provisions, which she thereupon distributed among the poor. And all this is borne out by way of the Talmud, too. They go on about Queen Helen and the gifts she gave to the temple. One was a plaque she put on the temple wall, uh, which was a suspected adulterous plaque from, uh, from Numbers, um, which is right after the Nazarite oath uh, thing in Numbers 5 and 6, where you have to have a certain number of witnesses before you can accuse a woman of adultery. So it seems that she was accused of adultery. She was very sensitive to that subject. And the other thing she gave to the temple was the big candelabra, the gold candelabra that you see in the Arch of Titus being taken to Rome after the victory celebration. So she gave both of those. This is a very important convert. Now in the book of Acts, I say in my books that the parallel to this thing is there is a Ethiopian queen's eunuch who sends her treasury representatives to Jerusalem. And on the way, he's stopped by an apostle called Philip. And Philip jumps on the back of his chariot and sees that the Ethiopian queen's eunuch is reading the Bible. But he's not reading Genesis 17 about circumcision. He's reading Isaiah 53, 11, the suffering servant, according to the story in the New Testament. And the teacher then, now represented as Philip, says, don't you understand the meaning of what you are reading? It's the same story exactly as the conversion episode of Queen Helen, but it's revised uh, into the suffering servant away from the circumcision issue. He then immediately uh, alights from the chariot and has himself baptized. And then Philip dematerializes, ends up in Caesarea when he's on his way to, to Gaza. Why would the representative of the queen, the treasury agent of the queen, be on the way to Gaza? Well, there was no Ethiopian queen at this time, you see, interested in uh, Christianity. You can look and look and look. We even have uh, her name, where they got her name was in Strabo's ge uh, geography. That's where they got her name from. Uh, repeated in um, the Elders' geography, or is it the Younger? I can't remember which. And there was a Nubian kingdom south of Egypt, which once had a, a queen uh, by the name of Candace, Kandakis, as it is in, in Greece, but that was 20 BC. And there's no indication that she was Christian or anything else. So, to my mind, this is a blind for the conversion of Queen Helen of Adiabene. The relation to the Queen's eunuch, uh, the Sudanese queens didn't have eunuchs and all that sort of thing. That all came from Persia and northern Iraq. The, uh, the Queen's eunuch is a play on circumcision, a uh, par parody of the, of the circumcision of the Zats, the son of Queen Helen. And they're sending their treasury representatives to Jerusalem to relieve the famine. You see, where they send them is to Egypt to buy grain, and Gaza is the gateway to Egypt. And that's why the treasury agent is on his way to Egypt to buy grain. But I think the key is that both have, do you understand the meaning of what you're reading? One is the basic proof text of Christianity as we know it, the suffering servant. The other is the circumcision episode of, of, of Abraham circumcising his whole uh, household. And to me, the glue has to do with the famine relief and she likewise sent a great sum of money to all the leaders in Jerusalem. And the distribution of the funds to the poor delivered many from extreme severity under the pressure of famine. Then, later on, we hear of this great tomb that they build outside the city of Jerusalem. Is that his brother Monobasis and became eager to, uh, to abandon their ancestral religion and adopt the practices of the Jews. This is still in northern Iraq, Syria. Not long afterwards, Azadis died, having pleaded 55 years of life, having been monarch for 24. I don't know if we can date him, but somewhere in the contemporary Paul. His orders were to the, that his brother Monobasis should succeed him on the throne. Oh, by the way, they call uh, Monobasis at one point Helen's only begotten, my only begotten, meaning her favorite son. 
Now, when we read the baptism of Jesus in the New Testament, we'll see the same Greek word applied to this. This is my only begotten Son, and Him I am well pleased. I hope I'll be able to show you that episode. But the same word is used here in the story of, uh, of Isaites. And uh, not many people know these stories, but uh, these are very important for historical Jesus studies. Any anyway, she arrived in Ayabini, but did not long survive her son, for weighed down with age and pain of sorrow, she quickly breathed her last. Munabasa sent her bones and those of his brother to Jerusalem, with instructions that they should be uh, buried in the three pyramids that his mother had erected at a distance of three furlongs from the city. Now, right after that, when Fadis was procurator of Judea, which is in the early 40s, I think, uh, 44, 45, again, uh, and a certain imposter named Theudas persuaded the majority of the masses to take up their possessions and follow him to the Jordan River. Now, that's referred to in the book of Acts. There's a speech in Acts 5, which is about Theudas, who thought he was somebody, and so on and so forth, and I'll read you that in a moment, stated that he was a prophet and that he commanded the river would be pardoned and would be provide them an easy passage. Theudas wants to lead the masses out in the wilderness, and this is right after the Queen Helen and uh, tomb episode, and part the Jordan River in reverse. What did Joshua do when he came into the country? Like Moses, he parted the Jordan River and allowed the Hebrew people to go through dry shop. Now, Theudas is doing it in reverse. He's leading the people out across, and he commanded the river would be parted and provide them easy passage. Fetus sent a squadron of cavalry after them. Then he fell upon them unexpectedly, this is in the early 40s, and slew after Jesus' death, no mention of Jesus here, uh, slew many of them, took many prisoners. But the Judas, you see, whoever, I think that means Thaddeus Judas. And if you'll know that Thaddeus Judas, also sometimes called Judas Thomas, Thomas Judas, you, you bring the two together, you get Theudas. Uh, Thaddeus and Thutis are basically quasi-similar names. But if you notice in the Apostle lists, and we'll look at those now in a moment, where Thaddeus is uh, mentioned, so for Mark and Matthew, there's an Apostle called Thaddeus. Matthew calls him Labaius, surname Thaddeus, whatever Labaius means. But Luke calls him Judas of James. Judas, probably the brother of James. Therefore, probably the brother of Jesus. But you have to look at this Theudas as being a kind of Jesus type. Jesus wants to lead the people out into the wilderness. Jesus wants to do signs there and so on. Uh, Theudas uh, wants to part the Jordan River in reverse. Why does he want to part the Jordan River in reverse? Ah, because the land is polluted. The Romans are controlling it. The Rhodians are controlling it. And we have to go back to the wilderness. And uh, this is a nationalist leader, clearly. And um, I think the same kind of attitude is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls speak about uh, going out of the land of Judah to dwell in the land of Damascus. That's one of the motifs in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There to raise up the new covenant. But the new covenant, in fact, is just a reiteration of the old with more uh, zealousness, like the teacher Izzati's encounters in northern Syria. Theudas was captured, whereupon he was beheaded and brought to Jerusalem. There's the only beheading so far that we, uh, that we have mentioned here. Uh, and these are the events that befell uh, in Cuspius Fetus was procurator. Now if you look at an episode in Acts before the introduction of James, uh, uh, it says James the brother of John was executed by the sword, meaning beheaded, by Herod. Now this is clearly supposed to be in the same period as this is happening. To my mind, Josephus lists all the beheadings of things. He loves that kind of stuff. He's not going to miss any. These are two parallel episodes that you have to put side by side. And to, to, I, I make a thing that the key issue here is the brother thing, the Judas of James uh, matter. The successor of Fadus was Tiberius Alexander, the son of that Alexander, who had been out of bark in Alexandria and who surpassed all his fellow citizens, both in ancestry and in wealth. But you see, Tiberius is a backslider from Judaism. 
He is a Roman bureaucrat. He serves the Romans. He's also mentioned in Acts as Alexander. He's one of the people persecuting early Christians in the approximately Acts 3 or 4. You'll come across him. It was in the administration of Tiberius Alexander that the great famine occurred in, in Judea, during which Queen Helen brought grain from Egypt for large sums and distributed to the needy, as I have stated above. Besides this, James and Simon, the son of Judas the Galilean, were brought up for trial, and at the order of Alexander, they were crucified. This was the Judas who, as I explained above, had aroused the people to revolt against the Romans. Remember that? We talked about that last time. Judas the Galilean, who started the Zealot movement in 4 B.C. to 7 A.D. These were the sons, he says, of that Judas. I'm going to show you what Acts does with this. And that's why we, we say Acts is dependent on Josephus, but often garbles it. This was the Judas who, as I have explained above, had aroused the people to revolt against the Romans while Quirinius was taking the census in Judea. Why am I reading this? Because we're going to read about the census of Quirinius momentarily with the birth of Jesus, aren't we? Herod, king of Chalcos, that's another Herod, now removed Joseph, the son of Cammai from the high priest, and assigned the office to Ananias, the son of Nebedeus, a successor to Commandus, also became a successor to Tiberius Alexander. Herod, the brother of the great king Agrippa, died in the eighth year of the reign. See, he's very precise here, and blah, 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 blah. But notice the sequence here. There is Queen Helen and her son's conversion sometime in the 20s to the 40s or whatever. He makes it clear the famine relief is actually in the mid-40s. There's a tomb built in Jerusalem by Queen Helen, in which both Queen Helen and his Zaddis are laid, not far from Jerusalem, by Monobasis, because his Zaddis is, is Helen's only begotten. And it'll be the same in, uh, as God cries out for Jesus. And they follow, end up a more zealous form, Opposing the Pauline Ananias approach, I think, that circumcision is not required, only faith in Christ Jesus. And, and circumcision is a sine qua non, the party of the circumcision, the, the James party in Jerusalem. These are the themes that are spreading around, and there is missionary work going on in northern Syria. Now, uh, the problems in Antioch, where the Pauline community, according to Acts, is founded, where Christians were first called Christians, according to Acts, there's a question which Antioch we mean. A lot of people think we're talking about Antioch on the Orontes. Well, there was the Orontes River was here, and there was an Antioch here, which was a kind of almost a seaport, and became was the capital of the Seleucid Empire. So everyone said, oh, they're talking about that Antioch. But it turns out that this um, Seleucid king loved his father, who was called, the founder of the dynasty was called Antioch. And he, and he founded four Antiochus. One of them is over here in northern Syria, the, the town that later became known as Edessa, where the Holy Shroud came from. And this was called Antioch by Calero, and this is right near Abraham's Haram. To my mind, this is where these things are, are, are happening. And, and all of Syriac Christianity is formed there. There's a big story about Helen being the wife of the king there and so on in Syriac uh, history. And, I, and that's what I have, uh, and there's two others. There's one down here, another Antioch here, and, uh, and then even Max says there's an Antioch over here, Antioch in Pisidia, that Paul visits. So there's at least four Antiochs. To my mind, nothing was going on in this Antioch. Everything was going on over in this Antioch. Now you say, so what? Well. That would put the Pauline community right in the midst of these things there. I don't say I've proved it, I'm just saying that's a very important thing to, uh, to consider. I mean, the Book of Acts doesn't know which Antioch it's talking about. It just says Antioch. So we don't know, it doesn't know, and it doesn't say Antioch out of the city. And the area seems to have nothing to do with, um, and the famine relief is coming from Antioch by Calero, Antioch by Haran, Antioch where there's these conversions take place. Anyway. There's famine relief coming from over there, the capital of that kingdom, Adiabene, and this other neighboring kingdom, um, which is where Syriac Christianity uh, developed. Then, right after that, there's the famine. Connected to the famine is this Theudas affair. So Theudas has to come around 44 AD or so, 45 AD. 
Then after that, in 48 AD, and all the trouble that's going on, Josephus tells us the two sons of Judas the Galilean are executed, right? They're called uh, James and Simon again, the same names as some of the apostles, popular names. And then, because they're executed, then he wants to tell us about Judas the Galilean at the time of the famine. All right, Acts 5. It's supposed to be a speech when Peter and the others are dragged before the Sanhedrin and a Pharisee called Gamaliel, who also appears in the pseudo-Clementines, as a sympathizer to the movement, and uh, as it was also the name of Paul's teacher, a teacher of the law, honored by the people, rose up in the Sanhedrin and commanded the apostles to be put him out for a short while. And then he said to the members of the Sanhedrin, line 34-35, Man, Israelites, be careful how you treat these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, boasting himself to be a somebody. To whom a number of men, uh, about 400, were joined. I think it was more than that in Josephus. I don't know if he gives 4,000 or what, but anyway. He was killed, but no specific how he was killed. And all of them were scattered and came to nothing as many were following after. After this, one Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also was destroyed, and all of them were scattered as many were following him. Okay, there is the what we call the anachronism. But why does he make this mistake? Not Gamaliel, oh, there's no tape recorder at this time. Why does he? Because he's been reading his Josephus very quickly. And he and he notes that the Judas is mentioned, and then right after that the two sons of Judas the Galilean, and that they were the sons that, that taught rebellion at the time of the census of Quirinius. All the writer has done is dropped out the two sons of Judas the Galilean, and gone from Thutis, who thought he was a big shot, to Judas the Galilean, dropped out that little bit in between. And that's where he gets that mistaken sequence. In fact, Judas the Galilean is 40 years before Thutis. I just want to show you, how historical material is garbled, even in beloved documents. And there, everyone admits there's an anachronism, but no one understands how it happened. I understand how it happened, because I realized the person who did this was reading it just, just even very superficially, and in doing so, he got the chronology out of work. Now, another thing that relates to what we were reading, talking about the foundation of the, of the community in Antioch, now here we have material in chapter 11 of Acts. Talking about uh, Stephen and um, certain ones, was it Cyprus and Cyrene, 20 and 21, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now there, of course, is which Antioch? And Barnabas went out to Tarsus to look for Saul, so he's going to southern Turkey there. And founding him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they got together a, a church there and taught a huge crowd, and that's where the disciples were first called Christians. So again, once more in the 40s, in Antioch, either the one in um, southern Turkey or the one in northern Syria, and in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One named Agabus <laughs> rose up from among them, and I'm laughing because I don't believe any prophet ever existed called Agabus, and I think this is another garbling, and I'll tell you who Agabus is in a moment. And um, that this is, the, to my mind, the sloppiness of the writer of some of this material. And most of this material has been left unexamined for 2,000 years. And if you look at any of your textbooks about this episode, you'll find redaction criticism, form criticism, but no historical criticism. And that's the key. Now, look at this. Prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one named Agabus rose up from among them and showed by the Spirit that a great famine was going to come over the whole world. Well, obviously, it didn't over the whole world, but this is the famine in, we're talking about in Josephus. And what's the result of this famine that Agabus is come proclaiming down in Antioch? Paul and Barnabas will be sent up to Jerusalem with famine relief funds. Just like Queen Helen and her son are sent up, or, or but it's Queen Helen who has the means to do this. My conclusion is going to be that Paul and Barnabas are among Queen Helen's famine relief representatives. But I'll give you one other reason for thinking that. Um, and this happened in the time of Claudius Caesar. Okay, that's the same as Josephus. Remember they mentioned Claudius Caesar in those notes uh, 
that we were that we were talking about, and every one of the disciples decided to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, uh, which they did, sending it by the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, now chapter twelve. At that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to do evil to some of those of the church. We don't hear about the famine relief mission. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. To my mind, that's the parallel to the beheading of Theudas uh, that we have also related to the famine relief episode. There's a sequentiality here. But things are transformed into something else. You say, oh, you see, now James, the brother of John, and he's gotten rid of. And the rest is how Peter escapes from prison. This is supposed to be the famine relief episode. We don't hear anything about it. And then, what we suddenly hear in line 12, that Peter goes to the house of Mary, but she's not the mother of Jesus. She's the mother of someone we never heard of, John Mark, where they were all gathered. And Peter knocked at the door, and some ladies take his message. And finally he says, line 17, Go tell these things to James and the brother, and left and went to another place. What? Who's James? He was never introduced to us. We didn't know who he is. How come he was never introduced to us? Oh, he must be the other James. Oh no, the other James has been eliminated here at the beginning of the chapter. Ah, the true history is bubbling through which shows that much of what came before is overwritten obfuscation because the election of James as leader of the early church is totally ignored in the story of Acts just as his death is. You say, well, why do they bother letting him emerge here? Because they couldn't, they couldn't, they, they couldn't avoid it. But they didn't tell you who he was and what his doctrine and positions were. He, according to Galatians, as I read you, is the party of the circumcision which James is. James, the brother of Jesus. There's still obfuscation here. But why does Peter go to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, to leave a message for James, the brother of Jesus? Because it isn't Mary, the mother of John Mark's house. It's Mary, the mother of James's house. That's why. You don't go to Mary, the mother of John Mark's house, to leave a, a message for James and the other brothers. Why doesn't the book of Acts want to tell it or uh, say it that way? So because the book of Acts is Pauline. And the Pauline uh, approach is Paul totally antithetical to the James party. And it certainly doesn't want to admit that Mary had any other son except Jesus. Okay, forget all that. This chapter goes on and Herod is, dies. That's also from Josephus. He's eaten up by worms or something. And then, line 25. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, having completed their mission, also bringing with them John Mark. That's why John Mark's mother was mentioned here. What? Well, what happened to the mission? What happened to the mission? They went, and they came back, but in between is all this other interesting stuff. All right, I'm, not, I'm saying that there's a lot of words and material all around the episodes that I that I just read to you there. And one last thing, Agabus. He will appear later in Acts as the prophet who grabs Paul's girdle, ties it in a knot in Caesarea, and tells him not to go up to Jerusalem because there's plotting against him up there. Chapter 21. Okay. But there's another story that Eusebius tells us that he took from the chancery records of, guess what, the city of Edessa, Antioch by uh, Calira. And that's the conversion of a king called Agberus. Agberus. And he calls him the great king of the peoples beyond the Euphrates. And in this conversion, which is the same time as the conversion of Queen Helen, and I think this is Queen Helen's husband from a different uh, perspective that is from more Arabic source, Agbar is being uh, Arabic language uh, type. Uh, uh, Syriac sources tell us that Queen Helen was the wife of King Agbarus, the great king of the people beyond the Euphrates. And here in Acts we have the great famine that was then across the whole world. I even believe the word great has wandered from the great king of the peoples beyond the Euphrates 
into the great famine that was then over the whole world. Now that's just a theory to explain some of these parallels and discrepancies, and certainly the material in uh, uh, Gamaliel's speech is taken from antiquities. And this is all non-we document material. When the we document material, uh, the character of acts uh, changes. It isn't this composite sort of thing. Uh, but I want to go over to um, the census of Quirinius a little more uh, before we then take up Jesus' birth at the time of the census of Quirinius. Now let's look at the Jewish wars description of the Jewish sects. Now in the antiquities, when did he start talking about the four Jewish sects? At the time that he mentions the fall of the successors to Herod from 4 BC to 7 AD, which is the time of the birth of Jesus in the Gospels, and uh, the rise of the uh, Zealot movement, the teaching of Judas and Setuk against what? The census of Quirinius against the tax, because they saw this as a uh, prelude to taxation. Chapter 8, 1. The territory of Archelaus, the successor to Herod in 4 BC when Herod died, was now reduced to a province, and Coponius, a Roman of the equestrian order, was sent out as procurator, as it was in the antiquities, entrusted by Augustus with full powers, Augustus is still emperor, including the, inf the infliction of capital punishment, which is really important. He has the right to inflict capital punishment. And that's always important. That's the governors, you see, not the Jews at this period that can inflict the capital punishment. Uh, only the Roman governors can do that. Under his administration, a Galilean, here we go, named Judas, a Galilean. Now, what does that mean? He didn't come from Galilee, says Antiquities. He came from Golan. So Galilean is often taken, Eusebius takes it that way, as the name of his movement, the Galilean movement. Who was the teacher that went over to uh, Queen Helen's son, Azadis, and taught you how to be circumcised? He was a Galilean. Inciting the countrymen to revolt, upbraiding them as cowards, for consenting to pay tribute to the Romans and tolerating mortal masters after having God for their Lord. I think that's basically the same as we heard in the other, right? That they shall call no man Lord. What's missing here? Judas has a colleague, Judas and Zadok. And the word Sadducee in Greek comes from the word Zadok. The colleague of Judas the Galilean is a Zadok. And also the scrolls are very interested in being called sons of Zadok, and they play with that name. For them, it can also mean the Tzadok or the Tzadik, because in Hebrew, Hebrew is a... Hebrew is a language built on three-letter roots. It's very rational. So is Arabic. All Semitic languages are built normally on three-letter roots. Depending on where you put the vowels, I think I told you a little bit about this, you, you, the word has a certain meaning. If you put it like that, it's Zedek righteousness. If you put it like this, it's Zadok the name. If you put it like this, double the D, it's Zadik, the righteous one. You can't tell the D has been doubled in normal Hebrew orthography. Zadok and Zadik would look the same in written Hebrew at that time because the Yud, as it's called here, and the O here look the same in written Hebrew at that time. And you can only know it's an I and an O uh, by knowing the word. So when you see Zadok, it can also read Tzadik. So it could be a person known as the Tzadik, the righteous one. What's James' cognomen in all early church literature? The Tzadik. James the Just. That's Latin for Tzadik. Dikaios in Greek. James the Righteous One. James the Tzadik. In any case, Judas Galileans uh, told the people that they shouldn't pay the tax to Rome. What does Paul say in Romans 13? The authorities were put here by God, therefore you should obey the authorities, therefore you should pay the taxes to them that ask for taxes, and you should love them, and this is loving your neighbor as yourself. And he quotes the, uh, the righteousness commandment that all these guys are quoting, and he quotes it in, uh, this would be looked upon in Palestine, total collaborator type language. And, uh, you know, that, so when people are taking an oath in the book of Acts, not to eat or drink till they have killed Paul, taking a temporary Nazarite oath, that is, and that's repeated 
uh, two or three times in, uh, from um, approximately oh, Acts 22 to Acts 25, and where in the we document, you have to understand why they feel that way. When Paul goes into the temple, James has sent him into the temple. Some people say James set him up. Uh, by saying, uh, look, Paul, we've heard rumors around here that you teach straying from the law, which is what he's doing in all his speeches. But to show there's no truth in any of this, go into the temple and uh, take a Nazarite oath. So Acts says, Paul goes into the temple there, and then some people see him and start to shriek and say, this is the man that goes around Asia preaching against our people, against the temple, and against the law. Now, is that a true accusation? Yes, it is. And they throw him out of the temple and bar the doors behind him. See, then after that, they take the oath to go and kill him. Of course, this is all portrayed negatively. Here's how you get the negative portrayal of the Jewish people. The Jews are all wrong here, and Paul's all right. But if you're another writer writing it, it you might have a different point of view, and that's what the scrolls are. In any event, um, now he's trying to introduce foreigners into the temple. And then uh, uh, the book back says, no, they'd seen him in town with a Greek and thought he was trying to do that, but really he wasn't. So the narrator has to sort of counter that particular charge. In the meantime, the Roman soldiers come out, take a hold of Paul, save him from the mob. Then Paul says, you arrest Roman citizens. And then he pulls out his Roman citizenship. But meanwhile, Paul's bustled off under guard, taken away, saved from the mob, not killed, etc., etc., etc. He's saved by the Roman soldiery. Okay, so it, it, this is where it starts, though, 4 B.C., 7 A.D. Now, look, the Jewish philosophy has three different groups, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes. This is, again, the same point as in the Antiquities, <coughs> after the census of Cyrenius and the discussion of the birth of the Zealots. But look, he um, doesn't discuss the Zealots here. He only discussed the Essenes at such tender length, Josephus now, that one assumes he spent time with the Essenes. And then he gives, uh, oh God, around 10 pages further on, he gives a little uh, description of the, uh, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But he didn't tell us about the Zealots. He didn't tell us, he just told us this sort of dribble about the Pharisees and Sadducees. Which, by the way, has been picked up in the New Testament too, in terms about how the Pharisees believe in the resurrection of the dead and the Sadducees don't. That's the argument that the Sanhedrin is presented as having uh, when Paul is being tried before the Sanhedrin and Paul makes a very clever remark there to, to set one group against the other. But there is something interesting here. As far as the Essenes go, at the end of his description, he says they're divided in the duration of their discipline into four grades. And insofar as the junior members are inferior to the seniors, that a senior, if, if he be touched by junior, must go and immerse himself, take a bath, as, as he had contacted an alien or a, a foreigner or an impure person. They live to great age, most of them upwards to a century, in consequence of the, I imagine, of the simplicity and regularity of their mode of life. They make light of danger and triumph over pain by their resolute will. Death, it, it, if it comes with honor, they consider better than immortality. In the war with the Romans, tried their souls through and through by every variety of test, racked and twisted, burned and broken, made to pass through every instrument of torture in order to induce them to blaspheme the lawgiver, and to eat some forbidden thing. Now in um, a different version of this, Hippolytus, a second century uh, Roman Greek theologian in Rome, he has another version of this and he says, yes, not to blaspheme Moses, the lawgiver, and not to eat things sacrificed to idols, which is James's instructions to overseas communities. Here this is translated in this Greek version of Josephus, not to eat some forbidden thing. And I think it's the other thing that's more precise. And there, the politics has it more precise. We'll find this very important. Nor ever once did they cringe to their persecutors or shed a tear, smiling in their ag agonies, mildly, deri mildly deriding their tormentors. They cheerfully resigned their souls, confident that they would one day receive them back again. Okay. Where did we hear that before? Under the description of the zealots in the antiquities. So what has Josephus done? He's clipped a bit from his description of the Essenes in the war and included it under his description of the Zealots in the Antiquities. It's the Zealots who are, under, who are willing to undergo any torture rather than call any man lord and are willing to die any kind of death rather than you know, uh, give up their attachment to the, uh, to the uh, law. So that's really interesting. 
So I think, in fact, this description of the war is not totally forthcoming. So um, we're talking about these early materials in the uh, different Gospels. I'll follow my harmony because I've been following it this way for 30 years and you follow your harmony. So we have the genealogies in terms of the early chapters of the Gospels, right? And those two genealogies are found in Matthew 1, 1 to 17, and uh, Luke 3, 23 to 38, right? There are many theories about these genealogies. Now once you see the genealogies have errors in them, then, of course, you feel that someone's been, I don't know, concocting them or some other kind of thing like that. What's the problem with these genealogies? In the first place, they're very confusing. Uh, we have to, uh, one goes one way upwards and the other goes downwards. Have you noticed that? One only goes to Abraham, which is Matthew, and the other Knowledge of knowledge goes all the way back to God and Adam. Well, you know, that's like taking me back to Lucy. Do you know who Lucy is? Yeah. Okay. Look, these are literary devices. That's always. These are literary devices presented to people who enjoy and rely on literary. Now, why am I doing this? We're trying to cut through to the historical Jesus. That's why we're doing it. We're trying to find out who he is, what he is. You know, when we're trying to use the data before us to see if we can if we can get anywhere. Then, of course, Luke has taken everything from uh, God down to Judah's son Perez right out of literary scripture, right? So he just accepted that at face value. At least Matthew doesn't, you know doesn't enter into those realms of live for 900 years, live for 75 years. I, I don't know how long these people are supposed to live for. So, in Matthew 1, they take it through Solomon, right? Son of the son of David. I have the first problem in Luke. They rather inject a Nathan, the son of David, in place of Solomon. So, there are all kinds of explanations for these problems. And that's not the only I'll find you more. In other words, the genealogies don't agree. So you say, which one is right? Well, in fact, in the end, if they don't agree, and you've only got two testimonies, then basically have to throw them both out. You can't rely on either of them. <laughs> you either, you know, neither is one is better than the other, is what I'm trying to say. Well, but the Catholic Church tries to get around this in catechism classes. They try to say, oh, one is the genealogy of Jesus' father and the other is the genealogy of Jesus' mother. Uh, they recognize that there are problems in the genealogies. The problem is Jesus' mother is supposed to be priestly in Luke. That is, she's uh, related to uh, John the Baptist's mother and they have a priestly lineage. I think that, as usual, just has the um, cobbling together something after the fact to try to satisfy issues of this kind that come up among curious parishioners. I don't think it really, you know, I think it begs the question. There's another thing that begs the question here, too. Well, once the Son of God conceptuality came into being, and you can say Jesus is the Son of God insofar as Adam is the Son of God, and Luke, if he's descended from Adam, he's the Son of God, but um, one of the manifold sons of God, um, all mankind, according to Judaism, are sons of God, at least all the righteous ones, the righteous ones, I think it's the book of Proverbs, are all the sons of God, or maybe it's in wisdom, one of those two, you can look it up in a concordance. But um, Joseph is not supposed to be Jesus' real father. So what are we giving the genealogies here for anyway? So I don't think that because we have some problems here, this should undermine your singing a hymn 
or feeling solidarity with fellow parishioners with whom you feel, to whom you feel close. Well, why should it? My best example are our presence. I mean, I don't think he really enjoys going to church. But they all go, I think, to display community solidarity and to give an identity. I'm not criticizing them. I just I think that's what they do because that's what the Arab historian Ibn Haldun wrote a book about called the uh, introduction to history in around the, the 13 or 1400s. And he had a theory of society, and he said the glue that holds society together is, in Arabic is a thing called uh, asabiya. We're translated into English is group solidarity. These are the things that make empires, kingships, countries powerful. It's really tribalism to some extent, you know, a, a development of tribalism. All right, so let's go to the contradictions that, and then move this likely just because I, I point out one or two things that make these things unreliable. So, I guess right there, David begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abijah, and Rehoboam, I don't know where they got all this. But Luke obviously didn't like that genealogy. What's the problem with that little glitch there? Why, why wouldn't someone like Luke want Jesus to be descended from David? What, what, what's the problem there? Solomon messed up. Yeah, Solomon messed up with who? He took Uriah's wife in a fairly, fairly underhand. But he saw her bathing one day. According to, I think this is a very colorful story. It could be right in Playboy. Uh, and as the poet, storyteller, tells a story, whether authentic or just an anti-David story or an anti-Solomon story, why would it, could it be an anti-Solomon story? It may not even be a true story at all. It could be a story by Solomon's enemies impugning his origin. The Dead Sea Scrolls, if you're interested, do mention this episode in the Damascus document uh, about the sons of Zadok. I followed after Precept. Precept was the spouter, that's the lying spouter, who it is written in, he shall surely spout, Micah 2.6, the, the opponent. Now here we are with the chorus of uh, our musical accompaniment now. <laughs> 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 that one there, yeah? Yeah, aren't we lucky? Okay. Shall be caught in fornication twice by taking a second wife while the first is still alive, so that means um, uh, it's against polygamy. Concerning the prince, it is written, Deuteronomy 17, 17, he shall not multiply wives unto himself. This is column five. But David did not read the sealed book of the law which was in the ark. They may mean Deuteronomy. That Deuteronomy was not found till later. They acknowledge that there's an issue there. As for David and Uriah the Hittite, they say, let God judge them. That particular issue. So what I'm saying, it was a problem for them, and you see here, it's a problem between these two genealogies. To my mind, when you have a contradiction, only two witnesses, you're in serious problems. All right, let's go down a bit further. And then after the carrying away to Babylon, Matthew 1.12, Oh, you see, they come back together again, I think, at that point. It goes, Melchi, Neri, Shaltia. They have Yekaniah begot Shaltia. Uh, again, there's a kind of, uh, they don't agree on who Shaltiel's father was, clearly. But from then on, they start to agree again. You see? But then they diverge again, oh, because you can't you can't have a different father for the same person. So something's wrong with the genealogy. A lot of trouble begins with Shaltiel and Zerubbabel because they can pick the other genealogies out of Scripture, but the closer to their own time they get, the less they know. Because they don't have the documents. They have more documents from 1100 <laughs> or the beginning of time to 500 than they have from 500 to 100. Zerubbabel Abiyud, Zerubbabel uh, Reza, <laughs> Abiyud Eliakim. Well, then it diverges again. 
And Azor begot Sadok according to Matthew. Um, I don't even see Sadok on the other is Sadok on the other genealogy. Uh, no, there's no Sadok on the other genealogy. There's Mattathias. Joseph. Well, they all go down to Joseph, but they don't agree. Now, from that moment on, in the synoptics, as we call them, Mark hasn't even appeared with any material, has he? In Mark and John, we do not have all this extra material about the birth of um, John the Baptist, the relation of John the Baptist's mother to Jesus' mother, allegedly. Um, the Matthew material about Jesus' birth. The two births, I'll go back to the birth next time. Um, which one is in the manger? Luke. So if Luke's in the manger, where is Matthew? He's at home, isn't he, I think? He did. Why does Luke have to take place in a manger? Because there was no room at the end. And therefore, we have the shepherds and everything in the crash and everybody sitting out in starry night in these wonderful bucolic pastoral scenes, right? Yeah, but that's only in one gospel. Luke, who is the most fertile, literally speaking. Matthew has Jesus living in Bethlehem all the time. So he doesn't have to be in a manger. Most people don't realize that. All these people arguing about shopping mall scenes of crushes and things like that, that isn't even verified in the scripture. Matthew doesn't have it. Because in Matthew's scenario, Jesus is born in before 4 BC, right? Because from our Josephus, we know that Herod died in 4 BC. And Herod is, at least allegedly in Matthew, still alive when Jesus is born because Herod wants to kill all the Jewish children. So Jesus is chronologically about 10 years older than Luke's Jesus. Historical Jesus is a difficult tough study. And you may not even get to a conclusion, unfortunately. Okay, here, Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was in this wise. When Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. There must be something before that, because I don't... Huh? Two one. Two one is that... Is that where it is? Okay, good. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, that behold, the wise man came to Jerusalem. Now, interest, that's Matthew 2, 1. Now, mind you, that's not parallel. So when a thing is in parallel, they don't put something next to it. Thanks for helping me on that. Um, normally, when you go to the shopping plaza, they mix this all together, don't they? They've got the star over Bethlehem shining down on the manger, don't they? And then they've got the three wise men and so on and so forth, right? That's what they usually have. So they. They conflate, conflation, put together. Different narrative lines. Make a single narrative of the whole thing. Most people do that subconsciously in their brain. So they show the star over Bethlehem and the three wise men coming. But the problem is, Jesus doesn't need uh, a crash here in Matthew. And when they saw the star, line 10, they rejoiced. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Why did they come into the house? Because Jesus has a house in Bethlehem. I know it's not as fun. Because Jesus has a house in Bethlehem because he lives there. What forces him to leave Bethlehem and go to Galilee? 
here I'm trying to kill all the Jewish children. Because he's afraid that like, like Moses, he's going to get killed. Our parents don't like that idea that he's going to get killed because God has a, a prophecy that some great man has been born and he's going to supplant him. So uh, Herod, you know, he's going to do this horrible thing. So therefore, they took off and go to Egypt. And then Matthew likes to apply biblical prophecy to everything. He picks them. I've called my son out of Egypt, that particular thing. But what's the next thing that happens in Matthew? Matthew has Jesus and his father, after things calm down, go where? North of Galilee, Nazareth, to be living in Nazareth. So that scenario, you realize, is different from Luke. You know that. What? Luke's scenario is what? Now it came to pass, Luke 2, 1, 7. In those days, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first census made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, Josephus tells us about, which is in 6 to 7 AD. That's why I tell you about the 10 year gap here. Why is he taking a census? What's Quirinius have to do with this area? The point of the matter is, Herod's already dead. Herod's son has succeeded him, Archelaus. Archelaus has uh, not been very effective. Archelaus, I think, is mentioned in Matthew. It says it was the time of Archelaus that Jesus went back to, uh, to Jesus' family went up to Nazareth. Huh? That's when they leave Egypt and go up there. So, um, in Josephus, what always happens when he starts to discuss the census, which is always a prelude to what? Taxation. And in this case, the imposition of direct Roman rule. The reason we were imposing direct Roman rule through procurators, prefects, <coughs> was that the Herodian family had elicited so much hostility on the Jewish population that there was uh, war and revolution constantly, even before Herod died, but after Herod died, from 4 BC to 7 AD. It's a period of terrible strife. Herod had people skinned alive, other people are burned. Uh, there are messianic contenders. He, uh, but what Josephus uses that period for is to launch into a discussion of the what? The sect. The sects of Judaism. He does it in uh, the Jewish War, and he does it in antiquity. So it's the census, and in particular in the antiquity, he says that the census brought out this discussion for and against. Now Jesus is involved in the census debate. Right? In the gospel. Brought out this discussion, and who was for the census? The toadying, accommodating, establishment high priest, particularly the priest that Herod brought in from Egypt, a Jewish priestly family from Egypt called Boethus, and the sons of Boethus. In the genealogies, if you look carefully at it, Herod's first wife named Mary, Matt Mariam, Miriam, was who? A Maccabean, right. What did he do to her? Well, it just seems in the Jewish war spends around four chapters. He loves glory, marital relations and stuff. What did he do to her? He ultimately had her killed. Why? He accused her of having illicit relations with his brother and that brother was called what? So that's the first Joseph and Mary story in literature. Uh, because Herod, Herod accuses her of uh, 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 incest or illicit relations while he's away in Rome with his uh, brother-in-law. And he has both of them executed. But he's already had children by her. That's the first marriage. Then, because he'd already killed her brother, Whose brother? 
the first Marion brother, what was his name? Jonathan, the last Maccabean high priest. Why did he kill Jonathan, her brother? Right. And that, I think, by the way, is where the Gospels get the idea of Herod wanting to kill all the Jewish children. He does that kind of thing, but for a specific purpose. In this case, I think that the, uh, I, I mentioned to you, when Herod married Miriam, the last Maccabean princess, under duress probably, her uh, handlers or people who were responsible for these things on her part, most of the male members of her family had already been executed, her mother that is, probably made a deal with Herod. Okay, you can have Miriam. You can get into Miriam the royal family, become royal. You're just a Greco-Arab outsider. You are not even of Hebrew descent to Jewish descent. I'm not saying that's bad, but that's how they would have seen it. We'll let you in. But on the condition that her brother, younger brother, Jonathan, becomes the high priest. And so Herod apparently, I think, kept to that until when the boy, and I think it was the age of 16, 13 or 17, but the age of 17 came to majority and put on the high priestly vestments for the first time that Herod had under control. When the crowd sees Jonathan put on the high priestly vestments of his ancestors, even if, even Josephus is forced to admit that it weeps. The crowd cries. Cries because it's so blue. Herod is so jealous, so ferociously, insanely jealous, that he has the boy taken down to his summer palace outside of Jericho. And while he's swimming in the pool down there, has some of his thug guards make believe they're playing rough with him and drowning. That's the end of the last Maccabean claim into the high priest. It's a very sad story. It's sad, it's so sad that it would make you cry if you cared about such things. But since nobody cares about such things, the whole world that we know is uninterested in the Maccabean family, and Jews themselves don't even know the story. Because it's not in the rabbinic literature, and most Jews don't read the secret. And Christians preserve the secret for the most part. Because why did Christians deserve to see this? They thought he mentioned Jesus. And he does mention John the Baptist. And he does mention Jesus. So it was important for witness to scripture to preserve to see this. The people who were writing it or copying it didn't realize they were also conserving a lot of other material that was uh, worse. But that never occurred to the copyists. They just copied it. Anyway, uh, Josephus, I have heard, I'm not an expert on the Greek Orthodox canon, is in the Greek Orthodox canon. It's so important is it considered to be. Okay. So, um, the tax debate at the time of the census is presented to you by Josephus as eliciting an argument between one of these descendants of Boethus, Yoazer in this case, who is Miriam, the daughter of Boethus, who is Herod's second wife named Mary, of a priest he brings in from Egypt, a more accommodating and manageable priest. And he argues with Judas and Sadok, Josephus said, over the tax issue. And then Josephus goes on to describe the Zealot movement descended from Judas and Sadok and says that they brought our country to destruction, they more than anything else, because our young men were, were zealous for it. And then he says, we have three other schools. And he goes on to describe Pharisees, Essenes, and, 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 and Sabbath. Uh, so in the Antiquities, that triggered it. In the war, he just talks about the different sects right after the Quirinius episode. So interestingly enough, in Luke, the story of the birth of the Messiah actually coincides with the story in Josephus of the birth of what we call the Zealot movement. The movement of those people who argued against the tax. And the imposition, and that what it implied, 
the imposition of direct Roman control. Okay, so uh, here in Luke 2, 7, and she laid him in a manger and so on, because, because of the tax, the theory was people have to come down from where they live to go to their family seat of origin. Uh, David is associated with Bethlehem. Why is David associated with Bethlehem? Well, I think the biblical David was born in Bethlehem, Maratha. And so if the biblical David was born in Bethlehem, so a thousand years later, the religious, uh, the spiritual David has to be born in Bethlehem according to the mindset of the people writing these things. I don't know why. Uh, but in any case, both Gospels really are anxious to get Jesus born in Bethlehem. Go to, uh, Luke goes to extraordinary means. He, he, he seizes on the census, gets him down there, but that's why there's no room at the inn. But you should look at Luke. I don't think there are three wise men in Luke. And there's no star. I'm not mistaken, that is the, that is the case. So you see how in the scenes in the shopping malls, all these things have been completed. Because they're the popular things. The star, the three wise, I've always seen the three wise men on their animals coming to the crash and all this kind of thing. Now, it didn't, didn't happen like that, not even according to the Gospels. It's not in the Gospels. And the star has to do with Jesus' house. And the three wise men come and knock on the front door of Jesus' house. The crash, the manger, has to do with the fact that there's no room. So many people are coming down there. And Luke presents it as being born. And we were doing the uh, description of the, uh, of the Essenes and the Antiquities, right? And uh, we started to look in the Jewish war, which was more extensive. I said there were some things taken from the description in the Jewish war and put into the antiquities, right? And I showed you specifically the movement started by Judas and Saduk, or Sadok, who were willing to martyr themselves. And then here we find that... Um, in Josephus' uh, description of the Essenes, which is much longer in the Jewish War, they're divided according to the duration of their discipline into four grades. And so far as junior members of fear to seniors, that a senior, if but touched by a junior, must take a bath or must take a ritual immersion, a purity uh, immersion. Notice in, uh, when Peter, in the book of Acts, Peter says that he has never um, eaten anything unclean, and at one point, um, someone says, uh, if you go into touch a foreigner or something like that, you know, forget what the actual passage is in the Gospels, but there are material like that. Um, of always negative, heaping abuse on the Jews for such practices. Here we have with the uh, Essenes and the Zealots, this matter of touching a foreigner, which is in the New Testament which disapproves of these things. So again, the New Testament has one attitude, or the, not totally consistent, but to more or less disapproves of these attitudes. Josephus doesn't approve or disapprove of the Essenes. He states it just as a fact. This is how they behave. They went even further. They wouldn't even touch an upper member and a lower member. And the pseudo-Clementines do present Peter as an archetypical essay. A Peter is presented in the Pseudo-Clementines, homilies particularly as a daily bather. He rises at dawn to meet the sun, just like the Essenes do here. He bathes before eating on a daily basis. He's a daily bather, what we call a marrow baptist. So um, is the gospel presentation, Acts presentation of Peter correct? Or is the Pseudo-Clementines presentation of Peter correct? In the Pseudo-Clementines, Peter is a... Um, Jamesy. He follows the instructions of James to the letter. But both, both Acts and the Pseudo-Clementines realize Peter is under James. So the gospel presentation of Peter as the leader is really a, a, a retrospective, latter-day, Romanized uh, portrait. I think that these Eastern texts uh, are more uh, clear on those points. Okay, so he's a daily bather as the Essenes were. So I would just say, if it acts like a duck, and it looks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it is a duck, that these people were Essenes. And Essenes were what Christians were in Palestine in the first century. 
And so when they go overseas and get colonized, they become Christians as we know them. I, I couldn't read it from that one, but this is, I should probably read it from here. Where, I got actually a fourth one, in fact. This is the uh, Greek English one, so you know that, you know, if you need, need to look up a word, then you can find it. And then uh, this is uh, the penguin one. Uh, so uh, here it is. So he says here, uh, among the Jews there are three sects, um, three schools of thought whose adherents are called Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, respectively. I think this is chapter 7. The Essenes profess a severe discipline. They are Jews by birth and peculiarly attached to each other. They eschew pleasure-seeking as a vice, regard temperance and mastery of passions as a virtue, scorn wedlock. They select other men's children while still pliable and teachable and fashion them after their own pattern. Not that they wish to any, do away with marriage as a means of continuing the race, but they are afraid of uh, promiscuity of women and convinced that none of the sex remains faithful to one man. <laughs> okay, this is Josephus now. Contemptuous for wealth, they are the poor, James' community was called the poor. They are communists to perfection, and none of them will be found to be better off than, than the rest. Uh, the rule that no business is admitted to the sect must surrender their property to the order, that's the common person in early Christianity, so that among them neither humiliating poverty nor excessive wealth is ever seen, but each man's possessions go into the general pool, and that's a big uh, point in Acts, if you know your book of Acts. The oil they regard as polluting. When adherents arrive from elsewhere, all, I'm skipping here, all local resources are put at their disposal. When they travel, they carry no baggage, only weapons. They do, they do arm themselves. So Jesus arms his followers in the Gospels at the end. Uh, Peter comes with one sword, and he says, no, take two, before the arrest episode in the, uh, night, in the night before the arrest in the garden at Gethsemane, if you recall. Um, in dress and personal appearance, they are like children. Neither garments nor shoes are changed, so they are worn, dropping to pieces. And that's what uh, the pseudo clemsians say about uh, Peter and his followers. They wore, they never changed their cloak. They wore shop-worn clothes. So there's all that uh, that is similar. So they work assiduously before noon. When again, uh, they show devotion to the deity before the sun rises. They do not utter a word. They're rising before the sun, same as Peter and the pseudo clemsians. Uh, they don linen clothes, wash all over with cold water, so they do the immersion. After that, they immerse themselves every day, just like Peter and the pseudo Clementines. Showing indignation only when justified, they keep their tempers under control, they champion good faith and serve the cause of peace. Every word they speak is more binding than an oath, swearing that they reject something worse than perjury. That's the same sort of Christians. They are wonderfully devoted to the work of the ancient writers, choosing mostly books that can help soul and body. A person desires of joining the sect are not immediately admitted, excluded for a whole year, a man is required to observe the same rule of life as members, receiving from them only a hatchet, a loincloth, and white garments. Uh, when this period has been ended, he is associated more closely with the rule permitted to share the pure waters of sanctification, so they then go into some purer form of baby. In two more years, his character is tested, and then before touching the pure food of the community, the Dead Sea Scrolls have pure food of the community, he must swear terrible oaths. First, that he will reveal, reveal God. Secondly, that he will deal justly, righteousness towards your fellow man. That's the righteous commandment. With his fellow man, will not injure anyone, and so on. And he will cooperate with the good and keep faith at all time, especially uh, with rulers, since all power is conferred with God. Now, that makes it look uh, more Pauline in, in uh, Roman. But the rulers may just be within the community. But it's, that's a very strange thing there because the Qumran documents just don't have such, a, uh, such an attitude at all. He further swears not to impart their teaching to any man, otherwise as he himself has received it, and so on. Uh, that's the beginning of the pseudo Clementines that James makes everyone swear not to impart the doc, uh, doctrines to outsiders and to keep everything between them uh, in a secret way. The scrolls have similar oaths. Uh, what they reverence most after God is the lawgiver. The lawgiver is Moses. So that uh, sets Paul outside of them in Galatians. And blaspheme him, blaspheming him is a capital offense. That's interesting. Blaspheming the lawgiver, Moses, is a capital offense. There are people in the book of Acts who want to kill Paul. Well, according to this doc document, that's a capital offense. They're divided into four grades. 
They are long lived, most of them passing a century. Owing to the simplicity of their daily life, I suppose, and regular routine, they despise danger and conquer pain by sheer willpower. If it comes with honor, they value that life better more than life without end. Their spirit was tested and broken, and so on and so forth in the recent war, and they will not blaspheme the lawgiver or eat forbidden food. Well, there's the contradiction of the vision in Acts. So as I was saying, either you feel that um, these people set the holy things up according to their precise specifications, which the Damascus document says in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's what the New Covenant is, or you think the Pauline New Testament Gospel view, that uh, there are no forbidden things as presented by the that, that's really where our issue is here. And then we got to put uh, Jesus in the middle of this. Now, I didn't find the thing that I was really looking for here. The next thing says their piety towards the deity takes a peculiar form. Before the sun is up, they utter no word, but offer to him certain prayers. So right before that bathing and rising, we have piety towards God. That is the first love commandment, loving, loving God. These are the two love commandments. Righteousness to fellow men. So that's John the Baptist teaching in Antiquities as we saw. That's the Essenes teaching. And that's Jesus teaching in the Gospels. So we have a direct line through these, through these three groups. And I probably can show you what James teaching too in his letters and what's ascribed to him. And then of course, as I said, this last bit here that the Essenes took part in the war against Rome. They make light of danger, triumph over pain, by their resolute will, death, if it comes with honor, they consider better than immortality. In the war with the Romans, they tried their souls through and through by every variety of tests, racked and twisted, burned and broken, made to pass every instrument of torture in order to introduce them to blaspheme their lawgiver or to eat some forbidden thing. They refused to yield or to, to either demand, or ever once did they cringe their persecutions or shed a tear. Smiling in their agonies and mildly deriding their tormentors, they cheerfully resigned their souls, confident that they would receive them back again. What are these? Martyrs. If you want first Christian martyrs, before Christian martyrs, these are the first martyrs. These are martyrs. They're just not Christian in the, in the same quote, but they are what the Christians feel martyrs are. Who will not, you know, blaspheme, will not utter anything, resign their souls, or prepare to die for their, for their cult. The only difference is that in the, this was written when? In the early 70s, and the Antiquities was written in the early 90s, and uh, in, the, in the Antiquities he changes his tune. He says this about the movement of Judas and Saduk, not about the Essenes. So here we see that the Essenes participated in the war against Rome, according to the, to the Jewish war, or what Josephus was calling Essenes. So they're not so peace-loving. And uh, in another version of this that I've told you about, a person called Hippolytus, which is second century Roman church uh, the theological figure. You can get him in the Antinous Nicene Church Fathers. And Josephus says, he spends about six pages on the Essenes and maybe half a page on the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's not interested in the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's only interested in the Hippolytus has it differently. He says there are four groups of Essenes. And it's clearly based on a different version of Josephus. He doesn't, not writing himself, he's, he's cribbing from a different version. And he says one of these groups are called Zealot Essenes. Another group are called Sicari Essenes. Now that really, I have that in my book now, very carefully presented to people. It was a, I had it in the James book somewhat, but not as carefully presented. Now, the Sicarii we meet in the book of Acts, they are the terrorists, called after the, uh, supposedly after the knife they wore to their garments to assassinate their opponents. They're the extreme zealots, but I don't think that's a proper way of seeing them. Judas Iscariot is clearly supposed to be the Sicarii. That's where the word Iscariot comes from, I'll tell you that more when we do the Gospels. There's no other word that Iscariot can, can even relate to, it's just reverse the I and the S. Sicarios, Iscariot. And um, I think he's meant to be that. And Judas, don't forget, Judas the Galilean founds the Sicarii. Sica is Roman for short knife. 
Anyway, what Hippolytus says, just to clarify this, about the Zealot or Sicarii Essenes, is that if they see anyone discussing the law who is not circumcised, they will offer him the choice to circumcise or death. In other words, a person like Paul, who thinks he can discuss the law with this is not extreme in, in some ways, if you understand the period. I know it sounds awful to us, but for them at that time, what was circumcision? It was the sign of the covenant, that they had taken the covenant upon themselves, upon their flesh. The Egyptians had it apparently before them, Muslims have it, James and Christians have it. What were these people saying? You can't talk about the covenant unless you come in under the covenant. Unless you're, you first have to take the covenant upon yourself. Then you can debate the covenant. Now, from their point of view, there's a rationale to that. How can you speak about the new covenant? How can you speak about heirs to the covenant? So, that's what they were saying. That's what the James party was saying. And uh, the other thing it said, that in the recent war with the Romans, this is the Sicari Essenes now, they were willing to undergo any torture, and etc., etc., et cetera, exactly the words that we have here, and not to blaspheme the lawgiver, yes, and not to eat things sacrificed to idols. It doesn't say eat forbidden things, it says not to eat things sacrificed to idols. Uh, if you know Acts 15, after the Jerusalem conference, when Paul comes up to teach the way he's preaching the gospel, some people who insisted on circumcision were coming down, Acts 15, 1 says, and disturbing his communities in Antioch. So he went to, up to Jerusalem to put the position that he had adopted before the members of the church. And he that's where James first appears in Acts as a bona fide person with no introduction of who he was or where he came from. And he's the leader of the early church. Now Peter's already fled with death sentence on his head because he escaped from prison. And the guards were executed. That was around Acts 11 or something. But somehow Peter's back there giving speeches in Jerusalem. The way Acts presents it, at the end of the Jerusalem conference, James says, this is what we want to put on Gentiles. They show, this by the way becomes the, the, the base of Islamic dietary regulations. Muhammad repeats it almost word for word in the Quran around six times. Stay away from blood, things sacrificed to idols, fornication, and strangled things. Strangled things is a garbling, clarified in the pseudo-clementines and also in the Quran as carrion, because uh, uh, beasts of prey would, would it attack a, 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 another uh, uh, creature it, it, you know, through suffocation. And it's garbling of that word into, into Greek, but it's much clearer in the pseudo Clementines. I give the references in my books, both the homilies and the recognitions that it has to do with uh, carrion. Uh, in any event, Paul debates things sacrificed to idols in 1 Corinthians, where he dismisses it as weakness, and we don't need all that stuff. So it's clearly he's upset by James' rulings. He knows that this is a ruling that's laid on him. What does he finally come up with at the end? Oh, he comes up with Holy Communion. By the very end of his discussion of things sacrificed to idols, he says, uh, therefore, um, you know, drink this cup and eat this bread and uh, communion with the body and blood of Christ Jesus is his final uh, conclusion. If you read chapter uh, 8 to 12 of 1 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul is very worried and finally dismisses the thing of uh, eating things sacrificed to idols. He says, for me there are no forbidden things. Starts that in Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and repeats it, I think, around 1 Corinthians 9 or 10. And he says, but look, an idol is nothing in the world. But some people have scruples. It means by that some people observe the law. You know, they're weak. Their consciences are weak. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, all the food in the butcher shop is clean. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 8 to uh, 10. So here these people are willing to undergo any torture, die any form of death, according to Hippolytus, rather than eat things sacrificed to idols. And these are the Sicarii essence. And he just dismisses it like that. Well, there's going to be there's going to be real issues between those people. I just wanted to read you this thing about these people who lead them, uh, their followers out into the wilderness, there to show them the signs of their impending uh, salvation. 
Uh, these people that Josephus heaps abuse on without end, he hates these people. This is uh, to be found in the um, Jewish War, 2.13.1. Oh, he introduces the Sicarii. Besides, these was a, another body of villains with pure hands, but more impious, worse than the Sicarii. With no less than the uh, assassins ruined the peace of the city. Deceivers and impostors under the pretense of divine inspiration, fostering revolutionary changes, persuaded the masses to act like madmen and led them out into the desert under the belief that God would there give them the signs of their deliverance, of their redemption. Uh, that is a theme running all through the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that he's for or against Jesus here, but he would see people like the, the person presented in the Gospels as one of these impostors, deceivers, pseudo-prophets, fostering innovation and revolutionary change. Uh, he says it's also in Antiquities 20. These works that were done by the robbers filled the city with all sorts of impiety, and now these impostors and deceivers persuaded the multitude to follow them out into the wilderness and pretend that they would exhibit the signs and wonders he says that about three or four places, okay? So look at that, signs and wonders. That's what Jesus is presented as doing in the Gospels, showing the signs and wonders. Now, for us, Jesus is the legitimate Messiah. For a person like uh, Josephus, he would be one of these other people. But in any case, that's where we stand. I don't think we need to read any more of Josephus. Let me just pick up uh, the Gospel of John. John 2. In the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Cana of, of Galilee. Galilee, Galileans. Cana, Cananeans. What are the Cananeans in Hebrew? Cananeans is Cana Elohim. Zeal for God. The Cananeans or first seen are the Zealots in Hebrew. Elijah has zeal for God. Jesus will have zeal for God in, also in the Gospel of John. But anyway, Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus was invited to the marriage. This is the first episode in uh, John. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to them, They have no wine. And Jesus answered her, What is that to me and you, woman? My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he may say to you, do it. And six stone water pots were there, placed according to their cleansing laws of the Jews. Come on, placed according to the cleansing laws of the Jews. Is this a Jew writing this? No. It's Greek. How do we know it? A Jew wouldn't say placed according to the... He either might say placed according to our cleansing laws. It's someone who's outside who feels he has to explain to his audience that these are Jewish practices writing and that's in the actual Greek, cleansing law of the Jews. I mean, even Josephus wouldn't, uh, wouldn't write like that. It also shows the negativity. Jesus said to them, fill the water pot from the water, and they filled them to the brim. This is the beginning of the miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, revealing his glory. Now, if you look at the Greek, it actually doesn't say miracles, I don't think. It says these are the signs. See, And so what does Josephus say? These I'm not saying that Jesus is an imposter or a deceiver. Josephus is more likely an imposter and a deceiver. But he's, he's, he's aware of these kind of people. That this is what they're doing. These showing them the signs of their impending redemption or uh, freedom. Now, this is not a wilderness episode. Uh, but the uh, the synoptic gospels will have a wilderness episode where Jesus does a parallel thing, multiplies the loaves and the fishes out in the wilderness with the people uh, arranged in in uh, camp. Interestingly enough, right after that, John places the temple cleansing episode, and it is in his gospel line 17 uh, of chapter two that Jesus gets around pretty fast. By the way. Uh, here he's in Galilee, supposedly. The next thing he's down in Jerusalem. And uh, he says, Do not make my father's house a house of den of thieves or a house for gain. And then he says, Zeal of your house has consumed me. I think this is Psalm 68.9. We'll look at Psalm 68.9 next time just so that we can 
uh, see exactly what the psalm says. And then the Jews answered, see the Jews again. This is that Jesus is not an a, a Jew. It's not the way that, that a, a, a normal Jewish person writing some truth would phrase it. They would say, then the people said to him. They wouldn't say that the Jews are different. One last thing, in chapter 4, Jesus came into Cana of Galilee again, here, at the end of 4, where he made the water into wine. And then Jesus said to him, this person who was, I think, doubting, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So, once again, these are, uh, uh, I think here, what happens? He, he raises a son, or a son is close to death, and he says, go back and your son will be living. And so in 54, it says, this is the second sign that Jesus did coming out of Judea into Galilee. This is the second sign. So again, signs and wonders are the name of the day or the uh, menu of the day for the uh, Gospel of John. And signs and wonders are also the menu of the day for Josephus.